once again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Ben Davis Sports Talk Show here on DeKalb Public Television, Mediacom, Cable Channel 20. And it certainly, certainly seems uh, unreal or hard to imagine that it's been 20 years since the movie Ho Hoosiers first premiered, not just in the state of Indiana, but throughout the country. And we are very, very pleased to be joined this morning by one of the, one of the stars of the movie, one of the players off that Hickory Huskers team, Brad Long. And Brad, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me, Bernie. I appreciate it. And Brad, we, uh, we interviewed uh, one of your teammates here a couple years ago, Steve Holler, and I guess we'll start the same way with you that we did with him. Tell us a little bit about your background, you know, where you went to school, grew up, maybe played high school basketball, and kind of what led you to the point of uh, being in the movie. Sure. Well, I'll tell you, I grew up in this area, Bernie. Uh, grew up in Greenwood, uh, Indiana, just south of Indianapolis. Uh, ended up going to the Greenwood schools up through eighth grade. Transferred over to the Center Grove area, eighth grade year. Uh, graduated from Center Grove High School in 1981. Uh, played basketball there uh, at Center Grove as well as ran cross country and ran track. Uh, ended up going to a small school in Kansas, which you probably never heard of, Southwestern College in Winfield, Kansas. It was an NAIA school. Uh, played four years down there, was captain my senior year. And actually, after I graduated in the spring of 85, uh, signed with a company called Justin, so I'm still presently with. And then bring you into about the end of July after that signing, read about an article in the newspaper looking for uh, actors to portray these uh, Hickory, this Hickory High School basketball team. Felt like I was too old to portray a high school player. I was 23 at the time, just graduated college. But one thing led to another and tried out and uh, uh, happened to get, become a member of the Hickory Husker team. <laughs> now, how, how difficult was it when you went for the tryout? Uh, how many people were there? How many did they accept uh, to look at? And, and maybe what separated you from the rest of the group that, uh, that eventually landed you the part? Right. I, we were told that they interviewed 8,000 young men. Uh, we were told they went to Indianapolis, Chicago, uh, uh, Los Angeles, and uh, all told 8,000 was the number that we heard. So we felt like it was a real honor just to be chosen as a member of the team. Uh, put us through basketball drills, uh, almost like just trying out for a basketball team. Actually, the acting part was kind of secondary. Uh, they did have us read some script, do some screen tests, I guess, if you will. I guess, if nothing else, just see whether or not we'd be able to uh, to come off as, a, as an actor, uh, per se. I always tell people in most sports movies, they look for actors, hope they can play basketball. This movie, they took a different twist. They looked for basketball players and hope they could act. So they took kind of a chance on us. Uh, but I just happened to kind of fit a character they were looking for, got a lucky break, and end up with uh, part of Buddy. You know, you played the part of uh, Buddy, Buddy Walker. For some reason, for years, I always thought the name was Buddy Rocker. And yeah. kind of they announced that uh, you, you don't hear the last name really mentioned too much in the movie, and I don't know why I always thought that, but it, it was Buddy Walker. Now, when you were when you were doing this, did you were you trying out for specific parts or just trying out, and then they they would assign you to a part? Good question. We really didn't know where they were going to put us. Uh, there, we didn't even we, actually we hadn't even seen the script. Um, we just knew that we were trying out as basketball players to portray this high school team, kind of based on the Milan story from '54. Um, didn't know which character really we were reading for. They kind of put us where they saw fit after some of the readings and tryouts and. Uh, my character sketch, the character description of Buddy was um, uh, cocky, uh, captain of the team, the best ball handler. And, uh, you know, I hate to think of myself as cocky. I think maybe because I was one of the older players, they felt like I was confident enough to portray kind of a little bit of, you know, portray a little bit of arrogance. And plus, my character gets kicked off the team for being a little bit cocky, uh, which is kind of a fun scene to get to, to, to stretch and do. Most people that know me know I would never talk back to a coach and that type of thing. Um, ball handling, you know, I had played point guard in college, uh, and I was captain of, of my college team. So uh, kind of typecast to some degree, except for the cocky part. <laughs> you know, to revert back just a little bit, uh, when we had talked with uh, Steve and did the interview with Steve Holler, you know, he had the experience of actually playing on an Indiana State Championship team at Warsaw. Right. How well or how far, uh, uh, or the best year maybe that, that, that you had when you were in high school? Yeah, Steve had probably the uh, furthest run of any of the players. He actually was a state champion at Warsaw. I personally uh, won a sectional my sophomore year, never got out of the regional. So never got to experience what, what Steve did, at, in that case, at Market Square Arena. Uh, first time I ever got to play in Butler Fieldhouse was during this movie. And uh, that was a thrill, you know, to get to actually play in uh, such a famous arena. Um, I can tell you when we shot those final scenes, it felt real. It felt like we were actually in a real game. So 
you know, all these years later, I suppose, because I never got to do it in high school uh, in an actual game. I got to kind of do it in pretend fashion, and uh, so that, that kind of filled the void a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, when we first uh, actually, I, I guess, meet your uh, character in the movie, it's a scene where, uh, you know, Coach, Coach Dale Gene Hackman had come in, and uh, you, you, you alluded to it just a little bit here, being a little bit cocky, talking back to the mm -hmm. coach. Tell us about that scene and uh, what maybe what went into that scene and uh, um, maybe how you prepared for it and uh, really because it, it got it let the people know your character uh, r right off the bat right well I can tell you when we first did that scene um, the element of surprise was what I was supposed to kind of uh, portray in other words I was surprised that a coach would would kick me off the team because I was kind of the captain uh, um, you know holdover from the years before also I was uh, uh, George's son who was the interim coach and he gets kicked out of practice early on uh, Gene t coach Dale takes over and uh, as we played that scene out Gene Hackman took me aside and said you know your dad just gets kicked out of practice I think you would be more angry than surprised and so actually that was acting advice from Gene Hackman and so I played it more of an angry mode and if you watch the scene you'll notice that I'm kind of smart aleck and am a little bit angry and slap the door on my way out so I took Gene's advice and that's the way that's the scene they end up keeping the, keeping the one that I actually ended up more angry than surprised you know maybe I'm gonna plead naive here or what but I guess of all the times I've actually watched the movie and, and, and studied different parts of it I never realized that your character was the son of uh, the character, I guess, what Chelsea Ross played. Right, and, and you have every right to not know that because it really doesn't come out in the film. Uh, that's something that's in the script that I don't think is ever really uh, reflected in the film. Uh, but, however, that was in the script that George was my dad, and that was one of the reasons I was upset that he was kicked off the team. Uh, and also it adds a little bit of uh, intrigue there with me actually leaving the team and coming back, and, and George and everybody ended up backing Coach Hackman, you know, kind of the redemption theme. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah that's actually in the script and that never comes through that may be actually um, talked about in the DVD version where they talk about some of the uncut scenes I don't know but now you know <laughs> you know you speak, speaking of the uncut scenes you allude to um, a, a very you know I think they, they have 10 or 12 on the the special edition DVD when you buy it but the right. one that's particularly interesting and maybe there's uh, Mr. Anspawn Pizzo, I believe, had, had commented on that they really didn't want to take out, it was the last one to take out, the one where it explains how right. your character comes back to the team. And that's right. a question they always get. And, and many people wonder, I think it's maybe the second game where you're just there in the huddle. Absolutely. Explain, explain the whole storyline around yeah, that. Yeah, that's probably the biggest question that we had from the media. Uh, after the movie came out, uh, a lot of the critics were saying, you know, we really like the movie, but all of a sudden they end up with extra players. Or where did Buddy go? How did he end up back on the team? All of a sudden he's back. And you add to that the fact that I'm the most vocal, getting kicked out of practice, taking Wit with me, and Wit's dad brings him back. But all of a sudden, as you say, I'll, I reappear like a couple games later. Well, they did cut a scene. They end up on the cutting room floor, and that's in the DVD version. And in that scene, I drive up in a car, get out, walk into a barn. Gene Hackman's sitting on a bale of hay, kind of contemplating his future. It's after the townies have given him a rough time. Basically, the dialogue is, Coach, I made a mistake. I've been playing for Hickory my whole life. I'd like a second chance. And in a nutshell, he gives me a second chance, and I walk back to my car, drive off, and I'm back on the team. Well audiences don't see that scene so they have to make that connection or channel that gap if you will from buddy getting kicked off to buddy back on the team and i guess audiences are just to, supposed to assume that buddy straightened up and got back on the team but that is a scene that got cut and david still to this day and angelo say that upsets them that was the last scene to get cut because it was such a hole in the film to explain how buddy gets back on the team so but that is on the dvd thankfully so that explains it you know you mentioned the scene uh, of you coming into the barn jeans on the bale of hay there was another character that was a, a big part of that scene, the part played by uh, the cheerleader, uh, Libby Schenk, I believe. Right. Um, and and, and in, the re in the version that was released to the theaters, she really didn't have a big speaking part. But in that scene, the, she, she had somewhat of a speaking part where mm -hmm. she was kind of a, at odds with you for coming back. Uh, right. Tell us a little bit about her character and maybe the, the part that maybe she originally was supposed to be in the movie 
but mm -hmm. but then really was kind of was kind of cut to the background. Yeah, and let me let me uh, mention it actually wasn't Libby Schenck, it was Laura Robling. Okay. Yeah, Libby. Now it's confusing. There's three cheerleaders. Uh, Libby was Wade's sister. Libby was one of the cheerleaders. Um, the other one was uh, oh goodness, I'm having a brain fade here. I'll think of her name in a minute. She was the blonde. Uh, she was. It's been so long, I've forgotten everybody's uh, name. I might but, have it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll think of it here in a minute. But Laura Robling, Nancy Harris. That's okay. It, Nancy Harris. Nancy was the other cheerleader, and then Laura Robling played Loetta. She was my girlfriend. That, again, never comes out in the film. That's in the script. There's actually a couple scenes where I walk her to class, carrying her books to class. I give her a kiss before we get on the team bus. That was the only other love interest in the movie besides Gene Hackman and Barbara Hershey. But all that gets cut because it didn't advance the story. Uh, but you hit the nail on the head. Loetta, or Laura, uh, her real name, uh, had several scenes in the movie that got cut. And in that barn scene, she's kind of disgusted with me because I had defected to another team. So when I come in the barn and ask it back on the team, she's still kind of mad at me. And you see that a little bit, that tension in that scene. Now, she was, she played the part, she was Cletus's daughter, right. the principal's daughter. Right, okay. Loetta was her name in the movie. But, uh, yeah, and you mentioned she was actually, or no, the one cheerleader was Wade's sister. Right. In, in real life, I That guess. was Libby, yeah. And uh, Libby got, got the part that was Wade's sister, and I forget how that came into play. I think maybe uh, Angelo found out that uh, Wade was playing for L&M at the time, that his sister was a cheerleader, uh, and uh, made a contact there, and she got to come up and be one of the three cheerleaders. So that worked out pretty neat for Wade. <laughs> you know, you, you mentioned the, the angle of the love interest, you know, with Barbara Hershey and Gene, and, right. and the scene you just mentioned with yourself. When I saw the outtakes, I was kind of struck by uh, the, 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 the young lady just talking about playing, uh, that was the principal's daughter. It seemed like she had somewhat of a crush a little bit on Gene Hackman. Uh, at the dinner table, there was a scene that was cut where she was right. asking him about if he was married and dated. And then in the barn, it seemed like she was not not that she was flirting, but just maybe mm -hmm. she had a little bit of crush. And was that ever part of the storyline, I guess? Not really, but I know what you're talking about. You kind of saw that. I think that was just sort of uh, her flirtatious uh, character to some degree. Um, she kind of looked at uh, Gene, I think, almost as, as like an uncle because Cletus and, and Norman Dale were so close. Uh, but I know what you mean. There's a little bit of flirtation there. And uh, I think that's a credit to, to Laura, too. I think she's a good actress. And I feel bad for her because a lot of her scenes actually did get cut because some of those things did didn't advance the story, uh, but she was actually in the movie quite a bit more than, than the actual uh, final cut. Mm -hmm. You know, we've mentioned a number of times here Gene Hackman. Uh, tell us what it was like working with Gene and maybe some of the stories or little vignettes, if you will, that you remember about Gene that, um, that would interest our audience. Yeah, Gene was, you know, people always ask me what Gene's like, and I always tell people that he was just like, you know, your, your father. Uh, I mean, very down to earth. I think a lot of times um, actors tend to think that, uh, uh, or people tend to think of actors as being up on a pedestal and so much different and kind of unapproachable. And that we, we found that not to be the case with Gene and, uh, and Dennis Hopper. Just real down to earth, played cards with them. Uh, when we weren't shooting scenes, uh, threw the football around on set, got in trouble one day because he knocked over one of the cameras. Um, but Gene was a real good guy. Actually, I'll tell you a story about Gene. Uh, my wife and I got engaged uh, in July before we started filming the movie, and uh, Lisa, my now wife, came out one day with the ring she had bought, the wedding ring, to show me. Uh, this was at Butler Fieldhouse. We were filming there. And Lisa still tells this story, but Gene took 15, 20 minutes and went over and talked to Lisa, my Lisa, about the wedding and looked at the ring. And, you know, Lisa just was flabbergasted that Gene Hackman would spend that kind of time um, talking to, to her about our upcoming wedding. So just a real neat, personable guy. Gene Hackman is one of those guys. Uh, he's, a, he's a workaholic. I don't know how many movies he's done now. I think it's well over 90. Uh, he becomes that character. Uh, quick another story about Gene and I, and I think his, his abilities as an actor. Uh, here's a guy who had never played a high school basketball coach. And so we, before we started filming, we actually went to a couple high school practices at his asking. He thought it would be good for him to see uh, the body language, the verbiage, the way coaches interact with players. He wanted to absorb that, and he used that in this movie. You know, rather than a prima donna coming in and saying, I know what I'm doing, I don't need any help, he said, show me some high school practices. I want to go to a couple and see what they do. And that's what we did. So I think that's a credit to Gene Hackman. Now, you got to tell me a little bit about, I guess, uh, 
between takes a lot of times when you were in some downtime? There were some horse games that went on also? Yeah, we did. We'd play a lot of horse. Uh, i, I got to tell you a funny story on Jimmy. I don't think he'll mind. Morris is his real name. Guy who played Jimmy Chitwood. I had him down. I think it was well into the seven, dollars $800 range. <laughs> we were going double or nothing. It was just one of those days where I was hot and he was off. And, uh, of course, I didn't make him pay it. But uh, it was fun. We would get horse games going and just little friendly bets and, and things like that. Um, uh, one day, um, uh, Jimmy Jimmy Railson, who uh, played uh, one of the opposing He's teams, on Terhune, I yeah, believe. got hot one day and was hit, I don't know, like 17 in a row. From um, So our, those, those are kind of fun things that happen. We'd play three on three, four on four, uh, you know, off, off to the side whenever the cameras weren't rolling, just to bide our time. I mean, we were basketball players, you know, let's face it. I mean, when we weren't filming, uh, pretending to play basketball, we were playing in real life. So couldn't take it out of us. <laughs> you know, you, you mentioned Jimmy Rail's son. I was going to ask this a little bit later on, but since you touched on it, some of the, the players that, uh, you know, that were on the opposing team in the championship game, maybe some of the other teams, the Terhune team, right. how, how did they get their parts? Were they, were they actually in the running for parts that you guys eventually got and then uh, just ended up getting lesser parts? Or how did that all You hit the nail work? on the head. That's exactly what happened. When they tried all of us out, those 8,000 young men that they interviewed in those three cities, if you didn't make the final Hickory team, you were still uh, waiting in the wings, if you will, on the docket to be put on opposing teams. And that's where a lot of those players ended up. Yeah, they uh, ended up using a lot of guys. Even if you didn't make the Hickory team, there was a good chance you could be on one of the other teams uh, uh, down the road. And that's what happened with, with Jimmy Rail and uh, some of the other guys they ended up on opposing teams and did a great job. You couldn't make a movie without, uh, you know, other teams and other players and extras and all that type of thing. And I, real quickly, i got to tell you another Gene Hackman story. Speaking of extras, he told Entertainment Tonight when they came out and interviewed him that these were the best extras he had ever worked with. You think about all the movies Gene has done. And his comment was, only in Indiana could you get 8,000 people to come out and cheer for a fake basketball game. And that's probably true. You know, if you think about it, there's not many places that you could get that many people out mm -hmm. to do that. So I thought that was a real tribute to the Indiana fans as well. You know, you, uh, we talk a lot about Gene Hackman, Academy Award winning actor, but the other actor you mentioned, you know, Dennis Hopper, just you think about the career that he's had also. You go back, you right. know, making movies with John Wayne and sure. um, in the movie history, he'll go down as really one of the all-time, uh, maybe not leading men, but real character actors, real solid supporting actor. And uh, if you would, just tell, touch a little bit more, a little bit more in depth about working with Dennis and uh, maybe if you have any, any Dennis Hopper story. I hear yeah. he was pretty athletic in horse also. Yeah, he, he <laughs> would shoot with us. He threw, he's the one, I think, that knocked the camera down with football, so uh, he got in a little bit of trouble with that. But he was one of the boys. Uh, you know, I always tell Dennis Hopper stories uh, in that, uh, they, that he relates to James Dean. You know, he told us a lot about James Dean. He grew up with James Dean. He was in Rebel Without a Cause, Giant with James Dean, and uh, knew Natalie Wood, and it was kind of neat to get to kind of uh, learn a little bit more about James Dean, and James Dean, of course, from Fairmount, Indiana. So that was kind of a cool thing. You know, that kind of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, inroad there that he had with, with Indiana and with, with James Dean. Um, Dennis was one of those guys, you know, he'll be very upfront with you and tell you that he got into the drug scene in the 70s. Uh, basically missed the 1970s, as he, as he described it to us. He got very heavy into alcohol, and obviously that's, that's a bad thing. The good thing is he's turned his life around now. He's re recovered from all that and just woke up one day and said, hey, I don't want to die. You know, I want to live. And so now he, uh, what I've heard is he counsels uh, folks on that type thing now and uh, has just made a, you know, a 360-degree turnaround, starting with about Hoosiers, uh, Blue Velvet, did a couple of movies in there, and that kind of turned his career around. And uh, Dennis is still working uh, pretty regularly today. Oh, yeah. I think, he, think he's on a new series. Um, um, uh, uh, I'll think of the name of it in a minute. It's, uh, it's a Pentagon series, E E something. I don't know. I'll think of it. But he's on a new series, and um, uh, so he's working again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I guess the the story was he had basically got off the plane coming from rehab when when he came to came to yeah and, and he told the press you know he said this is a role that I have practiced uh, for my whole life you know he knew what it was like to to be uh, sloppy drunk you know that the scene I'll, I'll tell you and he's a he's a method actor as, as well uh, the scene where he came in drunk to the sectional uh, the story I heard and I didn't actually see it happen was he called on all of his uh, experience obviously with with his alcoholism but also so he spun himself around like four times in a row right before they shot the scene. And that, if you watch that scene, it looks like a guy who maybe who's played, 
you know, Dizzy Lizzy or something with a baseball bat. Uh, but, uh, you know, Dennis, man, what a, what a professional. And to get to have two guys of that caliber, Gene Hackman and Dennis Hopper, in the same movie, you know, was just a thrill and an honor. So, uh, neat guy. And, and I guess uh, we'd be amiss if we didn't uh, talk about the, the other leading person, the, the female lead in the movie, you know, Barbara Hershey. Uh, played the part of uh, Myra Fleener, which is kind right. of ironic. I'm driving here today, and I see Fleener's on the Oh, yeah. <laughs> what, what, right. what are the, what are the yeah, stars? Yeah, down the street. Like that. That's right. Yeah. And uh, talk, talk a little bit about Barbara Hershey and what it was like working with her. Yeah, Barbara was a neat gal. Um, she was probably, of the three big names, the one that was a little more aloof. And when I say that, just kept to herself a little bit, a little bit more private. Um, I think she just uh, didn't really know what the, what the Hoosiers thing was all about initially. Uh, but I think it grew on her. I think she grew into her part. Um, uh, we invited her to Thanksgiving dinner and she came this close to coming out but she ended up going back I think she had a son that was back in LA that she thought she should be with we understood that um, but uh, neat gal you know I had some conversations with her a couple of times I remember in the uh, the barber tent where you go get your hair cut to keep it look the same throughout the movie had to get to talk to her a little bit you know then and she had done quite a bit of work back in the 60s was kind of in the hippie generation to mm -hmm. some degree and and talked a little bit about that and uh, she's another gal that if you look around you'll see her working you know fairly regularly so really really an honor I guess to have uh, you know people of those caliber in the movie as well as Sheb Woolley who just died here you know a couple of years ago mm -hmm. um, Sheb was known for his flying purple people eater song All right, very famous right. in the late 50s um, he was in the movie High Noon with Gary Cooper uh, another kind of a, a famous tidbit about Sheb Woolley uh, and, and Sheb would entertain us uh, when we weren't shooting with his guitar so uh, we had it pretty good during during the shooting of the movie that's for sure uh, one of the other actors I wanted you to touch on that maybe wasn't uh, an Indiana born born and bred person uh, uh, was a character that played by Chelsea Ross. We mentioned right. him earlier, and uh, right. you've seen him in Major League and uh, Rudy, I guess. Uh, but talk a little bit about uh, the type of actor he is, and uh, he's just another guy that you see on a lot right. of things that doesn't really get a lot of the headlines that some of the other people. Chelsea play. is like the Energizer Bunny. I mean, he just keeps going. Every time I look, turn on the TV, periodically you'll see him in a series, you'll see him in a in a TV pilot, you'll see him in a sitcom you'll see him and he was in untouchables he was in bull durham he's been in quite a few movies um and he's one of those guys that never really is is kind of a lead role but always kind of a, a supporting role and just does a great job just a great actor uh played george you know what a what a thrill for him to get to play a kind of a confrontational scene with gene hackman where he gets kicked out of practice and that scene is very poignant. I mean, you can feel the tension as they kind of uh, get into it and then they draw a line and, and Gene ends up throwing uh, him. And, and again, he's my dad in the movie. It's one of the reasons I act so awful after he gets kicked out. But uh, Chelsea's a neat guy. And I ran into him in the streets of Chicago about five years after we finished Hoosiers. And he looked at me and called me over and just a neat guy. I really like Chelsea a lot. And, and like I said, he just continues to work as well. You know, if you watch the movie Hoosiers, how his character George is at the beginning and you know as you mentioned confrontational with Gene Hackman but as the movie goes on you can almost see the the transformation right. from antagonist to supporter supporter or backslapper if you will yeah. as to what uh, especially after I think the shooter scene where shooter wins the game with the the picket fence right and, 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 and that's by design I think you know I always tell people this movie is certainly about basketball I mean it's based on a true story it's based on the Milan miracle uh, you can't deny that it's a basketball movie but it's also a movie about redemption second chances you know that theme is throughout the movie you see Gene Hackman Norman Dale getting a second chance you see buddy my character getting a second chance although you don't see how I get cap get kicked out to get the second chance you see the town drunk Dennis Hopper shooter getting a second chance uh, uh, George as you said gradually kind of uh, coach jail wins him over he ends up being a supporter the, the townspeople the mayor and all of them who are ready to kick kick the coach out after a couple of practices are all of a sudden their best best buddy now with the coach as we make our run to the state title so you see that theme all the way through second chances Jimmy you know coming from not being on the team to actually being the star and winning the game for us so that movie or that theme of redemption or second chances is a universal theme I think people gravitate towards that because it tends to make you feel better about yourself when underdog makes good that makes you feel good because people think you know if they can do it I can do it yeah, I, you know, you, met, you mentioned Jimmy, and, you know, he has the line at the end, I'll make it, but really very minimal speaking lines in the movie, but th where his biggest 
where he has his biggest amount of uh, dialogue is is in the town hall scene. It's right. actually one of my favorite scenes in the movie, if not my favorite scene. I just tell me a little bit about how that scene played out, and maybe how long it took to do that entire that entire scene, and also yeah. comment on the the outtake. I guess there was some confrontation between the cheerleaders and the players that, that was that was taken out of that scene. Right. That that was an interesting scene because if I remember right, it was uh, about November, I think we were filming, about the middle of filming. Uh, it was cold that night. We had a couple players that actually were were fighting colds, fevers. So it was a combination of health issues as well as the elements outside and the uh, combustion, I guess, if you will, it was very tight space where we filmed in this vestibule leading into the church. So there was a lot of things going against us, <laughs> truthfully, and that may have actually helped the scene because that tension, that um, uh, you know, uh, trouble that we were having with with uh, uh, venues and, and health and things like that may have actually helped us do a better scene. It's hard to say, but that was a very poignant scene. Uh, that's the turning point for Jimmy, where he ends up getting back on the team. Turning point for Coach Dale, who ends up being kept because of Jimmy's support. Um, Neat scene at that church, as far as I understand, is still there, still standing where we filmed that uh, in Danville. But I remember it was um, it was a, it was a tough nut because there was just so many things going against us to get that scene shot. Uh, but I know I saw the dailies, which are the the uh, they show them that you know the next day or that night of what you shot, and it just we knew it was going to be powerful, and um, uh, it was a big part of it. Obviously, with the turning point of keeping Coach Dale, and then what happened after after they made the decision to do that. You know, you mentioned uh, the the venues, uh, the Danville. You know, we talk about the the gym at Knightstown. Tell us a little bit about. I think there were what three or four different places where the movie was actually filmed, right. and what it was like. I guess traveling from place to place to, to 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 get across the thought of the movie. Sure, it was like putting pieces of a puzzle together, Bernie. You take um, we we shot it out of sequence. We shot the sectional scenes at the beginning of filming. That was towards the end of the movie. Uh, you you learn that it literally is putting like pieces of a puzzle together. Our home gym was in Knightstown. Our home town was in New Richmond. Our home school was in Nineveh. The sectional was shot in Brownsburg. Uh, the semi-state scenes were shot in Lebanon. And of course, the final game scenes were shot at Butler Fieldhouse. So you take all those different things. And like you said, there were some exterior shots shot in Danville. The church scene was in Danville. Um, and literally, you go to these little towns, and whoever did the scouting to, to recruit these towns really did a great job because I really feel like they captured that era, that time period. The gyms looked very much like it was in 1952. The towns did. The cars were that style. Um, little things like the feel of a, of, a, of a regular season game. You know, my dad always talks about back in those days uh, that he played in the 50s that every game was like a sectional game. There just wasn't that much else to do in the small towns. There weren't a lot of shopping malls and big time movie theaters and all that. So everybody went to the high school games and I think they captured that feel um, in these towns you saw every game we played in pretty much packed to the hill and I, as I told you I played in college down in Kansas and I remember playing in Lloyd Noble Arena we played Oklahoma the uh, Oklahoma Sooners there that gym probably holds 18,000 people but I'm here to tell you I'm not sure it was any louder than Knightstown gym that held 800 it was just deafening in there you, know, you can put Lot, um, a very few people, 800 people, into a small gym, and it's loud. And that kind of captured that era. You know, every game was like a sectional game, and it was kind of neat to get to relive that era. You know, as a player, all these years later. You know, you mentioned the Knightstown gym, and uh, in the movie that was released, I don't believe you were actually in any of the locker room scenes. But you talk about tight, cramped quarters. The right. locker room at Knightstown that they used the the original oh, yeah. locker room was. And I've had the pleasure to to be in there and take a look at it, but it's very small. But uh, Mr. Ansball, they liked how that they got the feel with the one camera in that right. in that locker room. Right, and I think he did a great job. And I give David credit there. Uh, he did capture that. And there's a lot of ways you can shoot a scene like that. You can have several angles. You can have the locker room be big. But he said, you know, look, let's take it like it really was. You know, they had these little small dungeon locker rooms, cement, maybe one or two showers, and that's the way it was. You could have done a movie where you would have just used up-to-date facilities and tried to sell the audience on 
pretend you were in 1952. These guys decided, let's take people back into 1952. Let's use actual gyms, uh, actual towns, and let's create the feel and, and little things like it would be in 1952. Uh, they made us listen to Glenn Miller music, you know, to put us in the mood, pardon the pun, because it was one of Glenn's big hits. We had the satin shorts with the belts. Uh, we had the old Chuck Taylor black and white tennis shoes. These are things they did to make it seem real. If you look at some of the basketball courts, uh, the term the key came from that time period or that era when the lane was narrow and then the free throw line there was a circle, looked like a key. Uh, they were careful about things like that to make it seem realistic, a realistic portrayal of 1952. And I think these guys did a great job of doing that to make it seem like you were in that era. Mm -hmm. Hey, because we talked before we went on the air here about just the feel. The Knightstown Gym is still, if you go there today, it's almost identical to, to right. you know, to when you, to when you shot the movie. And I guess they looked at maybe 50, 60, 80 different gyms, and I believe even here in Auburn, uh, they looked at the, one of our old gyms here, right. it, it, which almost fits the bill. But like they said, the Knightstown Gym was just perfect. They were very picky. Gym. They were very picky. They wanted everything to be just right. And I'm sure Auburn, I'm sure places that they looked at, there might have been one or two little things that they said, you know, this isn't quite going to fly uh, to sell it as 1952. And so they took their time with that. I, I heard later they spent about a year and a half before they even came to film scouting the area, finding all these different venues in different towns. And uh, it was we get tickled even today. New Richmond comes to mind. Uh, if you tra travel to New Richmond, there's an actual sign as you go into town that says, Welcome to New Richmond, home of the Hickory Huskers. They still have embraced what was done there 21 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I had actually heard that they wanted to legally name their town to Hickory, Indiana, and uh, weren't able to, to quite uh, pull that off. But So instead of that, they put the sign up. So these towns, one of the reasons I think they were picked, um, Knightstown comes to mind. We just had a parade there here about a month ago. They had kind of a reunion there. And the people were just endearing. I mean, as we're going down the parade lap, they're yelling out our lines to us. They knew them better than we did. And I think that's one of the reasons these towns got picked, because of the people as well as the facilities that they had. But uh, And I'm a little biased. I'm, I'm a Hoosier, uh, born and, and raised in Indiana. And uh, I don't think you could have made a movie called Hoosiers and had the same feel for it if you'd have shot it in New Mexico. It just wouldn't have come off. Uh, realistically like it does actually shooting it here on the home turf. You know, the, uh, the movie Hoosiers, obviously a basketball movie. You've mentioned it more than once. But they also, there were other facets of the players, the people in the movie, their lives that they wanted to come across. And another one of the scenes that was cut, one that they tried to do that was the, the scene from the fields, the, the corn right. threshing or whatever, which I thought was a very touching, poignant scene, but it ended up getting cut out. Um, how do you feel? I know Steve said that was one of his favorite scenes. It, Steve and I have talked about this. It was one of my favorites, too. And, and the thing is, Bernie, what happens is, where do you, how do you pick and choose? What goes, what stays? What I was told was that they cut scenes that don't particularly advance the story. Um, there's a lot of neat scenes that may not particularly move the story forward, and so they've got to make some hard decisions. You know, what goes, what stays. I love that scene. Steve did, too. Most of the players did, because it very much captured uh, rural Indiana, you know, with the town coming together to help with the corn harvest and that type of thing. We actually had to be on set one of those days at 3 in the morning for a dawn shot as the sun was coming up, and I, I can still remember it was just beautiful. And some of those things didn't make it to print. You know, here I can have real sour grapes about my scene that got caught up, but that's just to show you it's not self-serving on my part. There's a lot of other neat scenes not involving me that didn't make it to print, and that's certainly one of them. And, uh, you know, I've, I've said it before. I think they should come out with an uncut version, and they kind of did that with the DVD. But they could probably do a three-hour Hoosiers and add a lot of those scenes, and people would sit through it because mm -hmm. there's some really neat things, I think, that, that were left out just for time element. They had to do it. You know, getting back to the, I, I guess, what they tried to get across as far as the, the basketball thought before we get into the championship game, which I want to talk about a little bit. But um, I felt that in the movie, you know, at the beginning, the first game where Coach Hackman or Coach Dale is making the point of the four passes, the four right. passes, the four passes, and the team looks obviously very clumsy doing that. Right. But then, at the, I don't know if it was in the championship game, but I think it might have been the game right before that. You watch the team and how they pass and how the offense works. It's very crisp. It's moving how it's supposed to be doing. And I guess it's just another one of those things, correct me if I'm wrong, of how 
the team evolved and the team got better. No, I think that again was by design. I think you're supposed to show kind of a raw, uh, I think there's a scene actually with, with Gene and uh, Myra Fleener's mother, uh, Opal, uh, in which he said it's just a bunch of colts trying to train and, 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 and you know break the colts. I think that was one of the lines in the movie. Mm -hmm. And that was by design. It was basically, he, you know, here Coach Dale had inherited a team that probably had pretty much relied on Jimmy to come down and, and create a shot for himself. Where now you create, you have a team or you mold a team where there's a little bit more teamwork. Guys aren't standing around watching Jimmy do his thing, working more as a team and therefore making them a better team. Jimmy probably had a better individual year the year before Coach Dale came, but Jimmy had a better team year when he came because we won the championship. Mm -hmm. So I think that was by design, showing that team concept of working together as a team, not one player winning a game, but all five cylinders. I think that's even in the movie as well, that line. Um, but that's good that you see that because I think that's one of the things Angelo wanted to kind of um, uh, portray is that, you know, here's a guy who came in, molded this kind of an individualistic team into a more of a team-oriented team, and because of that, won a state championship. And to get to that, that championship level, you have the scene, the famous game, I believe, is at the regional game where uh, the character Ollie makes the two free throws. Right. I just wanted you to touch a little bit, talk a little bit about is it Wade Wade Shank right. that played that part? And rumor has it he was the best player out of out of the bunch <laughs> of you. But who that? I guess that's debatable. But uh, uh, talk a little bit about his player and maybe it was. I guess it was. If you look at it, it's, it was his special moment in the movie. Yeah. He. Uh, I tell you about Wade. Wade was a good basketball player. Uh, I think you know. I always tell people he was acting to 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 play that badly. I mean, uh, you know, people don't realize that about Wade. He was a very good basketball player. And in that scene, and then throughout the movie, he has to play kind of a, uh, a bumbling player, not, not a very strong player. And so that's a tribute to him to be able to, to sell that. You know, I think only a really good basketball player could actually make yourself look bad uh, the way that he did. And that's a big scene because um, that's kind of his coming out party where he uh, wins a game for us you know, under, under extreme odds, you know, where we had a couple guys foul out. Uh, and Wade's a great guy. That was, uh, he was the youngest of the players in Incidentally. And I always tell people, people always ask me who's the best player. You know, one through eight, it, there wasn't a great deal of difference. Um, Steve Holler and myself uh, had played college basketball. Uh, I think Brad Scott Summers, I think, tried to walk on at Ball State. He may have maybe played a year. And he played um, part of Strap. Strap. Right. Um, Wade, of course, had a good career at LM. I don't know that he ended up playing in college. Probably could have. Um, one to eight, there wasn't a great deal of difference. Uh, but the fun part was just kind of getting to use our abilities based on the script and, and what you know what we were told to do. We weren't really supposed to go between our legs or behind our back because at that juncture and in, in time, you didn't see a lot of the fancy stuff. It was just more fundamentally oriented. Um, and so Steve Holler, for instance, to give him credit, I mean, he shot a set shot. That wasn't Steve's normal shot. He didn't shoot that at DePaul. But he realized that that was the time period. It might add a little bit of an effect and flavor if I learned to shoot a set shot. And at that time, the set shot was still in. So that was a hard thing for Steve to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I always admired him for doing that. Um, I kind of shot, I never shot a really a uh, good jump shot. I never really shot at the peak of my jump, probably like I should have, but I learned to even take it down further and I shot on the way up rather than a, a, a true jump shot. We, again, all of us tried to realize what are the things that players were doing in 1952 to make it look more realistic. So we, yeah, we were cognizant of not going between our legs behind our back or making a lot of no-look passes, stuff like that, which we all probably could have done uh, to make it more realistic. And a lot of the plays that we ran in the movie were set plays. However, some of the footage is real. I know during the final game sequence, uh, Angelo rolled the ball out there and said, play. We're going to film some of this. Some we'll keep, some we won't. So in the final game sequence, yes, some of those plays are staged, but a lot of it is we're just actually playing. They kept some of it. So, mm -hmm. You know, we've get, got to the point, I guess, of the championship game and what I have found amazing and I, I'm going to ask you what your take is on it. I guess from the the point where Steve the raid steals the ball there to set up the final shot that was all one rolling shot there was no stop cut tape you know keep going right. it was all done which really is a tribute to you guys uh, it looks so real 
and, and it came off so well. Well, I appreciate that. I always tell folks, you know, uh, the most takes it probably ever took for us to ever do a scene was maybe four. And the reason why, because we were basketball players. You know, look, if the movie would have been about bowling or ping pong, we might have been there all day trying to get the scene right. But all, all of us, players one through eight, had played some basketball, whether it was high school, college, what have you. And so, not that we were that good, but we were good enough to, to make the shot within two or three tries. Uh, on the other side of the coin, i got to tell you a personal story. There's a scene at the end of the movie in the final game, and you may remember this scene. I shoot a shot out of the corner, and I miss it long. Uh, their big center grabs a rebound. I sneak around, grab it, throw it up. Jimmy catches in the air and lays it in. That was a set play. That was one of the few set plays. Now, let me tell you about that scene. I missed that shot, which is what I was called on to do. Now, when we first shot the scene, I made the shot accidentally, and they had to yell cut. How many times do you make a basket and they yell cut? Well, it's ironic. I mean, I actually had to miss it. Anybody who plays basketball knows that it's actually harder to miss a shot the way you want to miss it than it is to make it. I had to miss it long. In other words, it had to be off the back of the rim from the corner so it would be a long rebound. So it was a little bit tough. Having said that, I think we did it in the second take. After I made the first one, they yelled cut. The second time I shot it so it went long off the iron, I think that's the one they kept. So, you know, if you hadn't played any basketball at all, that scene might have taken, you know, eight, nine takes to, to come, you know, to pull it off. So um, that was kind of, I guess, kind of a, a little bit of a tribute to us as players because we had played some basketball. So it didn't take too long to do a scene. You know, you mentioned about the shot and uh, shooting and, 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 that, and that whole premise of that. The final shot that, that Jimmy takes to win the game, done on the first take, correct? Yeah, let me tell you about that. That's another one of those chilling stories that gives you chills. That particular night, uh, he was warming up for that scene. And he'll tell you this, as sure as he's, if he was sitting here with us, he couldn't hit the side of a barn. He could not buy a basket. And I remember Gene Hackman saying to David, the director, we're going to have to move this kid in. We're going to be here all night. He's not hitting the shot. So I guess David um, very subtly and Angela went up to, to Morris, Jimmy, and said, uh, are you okay? Do you, do you need to move in? He said, no, I'm, I'm okay. Well, Jimmy, I mean, was Jim he nervous at all? No, I, I don't know. You have to ask Jimmy that. I, looking back, I mean, Jimmy is one of those guys, I mean, uh, I never saw him being nervous. If he did, he, did, he never, never, I never saw it in him. And he was always uh, just a, had the look of, of a basketball player, Rick Mount type, and a textbook shot, and uh, just seemed like Mr. Clutch to me and throughout the movie. And he proved his mettle in this particular scene. So after he talked to the director and writer saying, no, I don't need to Move, move in, I'm fine. Sure enough, the first scene we shot, he made it. And then subsequently, he made two more. So I remember kind of getting chills thinking, man, you know, this is an omen. You know, this guy, uh, Mars hadn't hit anything all night. He hits the three that actually count. You know, that's, that's thrilling. That's basketball. So, um, yeah, that's a true story. That actually happened. So. And, you know, I guess what I, I found amazing, that besides what you're saying about the shot he made, was the fact that this whole thing was done at, what, the halftime of a basketball game? Yes, they actually were trying to figure out how to get people out to uh, to fill the stands. And so if I remember right, my memory's getting bad as I get older here, but I think they had uh, kind of a high school showcase. They brought out some local teams. Broad Ripple comes to mind. I think Broad Ripple High School was involved. Um, and uh, there was some, they had like a double header. And so what they did was at halftime of these games, which a lot of their fan base would come watch and play, they filmed a lot of these scenes. And again, with the magic of two dimensions, you only need to fill up half, half a gym. It looks like the whole thing's full. You're not getting a panoramic shot. So these, these I think we filmed two or three nights. They ended up getting like 8,000 people there. I know one night. The other two nights, I think they had quite a few fans as well. And they did little raffle ideas. I think they raffled off one of the cars that Gene drove in the movie. Um, in fact, I saw the lady that won it. She was thrilled running through the hallway saying she won, she won. Um, so there were some creative ideas to get people in the stands. Never had to use, despite rumors that you hear, never had to use cardboard cutouts. I know they've had to do that in some movies to fill stands. We didn't have to do that. We actually had real fans uh, uh, all the nights that we filmed there, so it worked out pretty well. Now, before we call a conclusion to the show, just a few more questions, but a couple of the players we really haven't touched on or talked about a lot, and uh, uh, David Nydorf uh, played Shooter's son, and then the, uh, the character Merle Webb played by a Right. Can't pull a sad story there, but just yes. if you could touch on those two and maybe tell us a little bit about them. 
Right. Well, let me start with David. Uh, David Nydorf was probably, and David will sit here and tell you this, probably of all the players was the weakest of the eight. And keep in mind, he was a pretty good basketball player. That tells you there wasn't much differential between, say, one and, and eight. But David never played high school basketball. He just played a lot of picket ball out in California. And they discovered him on one of the uh, beaches, I think it was Ventura Beach, playing pickup basketball. Uh, but he had some acting experience. He had done Bull Durham. He had done Empire of the Sun. He was in Platoon. Right, Platoon. Uh, but he'd sit here and tell you, if he were sitting here, he didn't feel any different than the rest of us. He said uh, he went into it very humble, uh, did a great job. One of the best scenes in the movie, I think, is the hospital scene, a touching scene with him and, and Shooter when he's drying out in the scene and he tells him to go win, win the championship for him. It was a pretty cool scene, I think. And uh, David, great guy. And as far as I know, he's back out in L.A. And what I've heard is he's a professional poker player now. Uh, you may see him on one of these World Series of Poker tournaments, you never know. Um, as far as Kent, Kent was my roommate in the movie, and I'm still uh, I'm still sad about uh, him uh, uh, and the events surrounding his death, uh, uh, taking of, of his life, as you know. Um, Kent was one of those guys that had it all. Uh, all through his life, things went his way. He was always in the middle life of the party. He was a very personal guy, friendly guy. His business was going well. Marriage was great, kids. And I think just some things started happening with his business, um, uh, pending divorce, and some things at, a, at around age 37. And uh, just because he had never really dealt with a lot of adversity up to that point, I feel from what I've seen, uh, the little that I know about it, uh, that maybe he just had a tough time dealing with all that hitting at once. And I know Judy, um, his wife at the time, told me that that was kind of the case, that he just kind of went into a little bit of a black hole and just couldn't climb out. And uh, just a sad situation. I still feel in my heart that Kent was not in his right mind to do that. I don't feel like anybody that ever does that is. And so uh, I think there was just a lot of things weighing on him. And just uh, I just you know think back, we all do, there's something we could have done to keep that from happening. But uh, what a great guy. And played Merle, had probably the signature line in the movie when he says, let's win it for all the small schools and never had a chance to get here. To me, that's one of the signature lines of, of the movie. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, just a little bit earlier, they had a 20-year reunion this uh, this past summer, not too long ago, actually, just about a month or so ago, over in Knightstown. And then you met, you saw a few of the players there. I mean, how, how often do you guys keep in touch, or do you keep in touch? Uh, well, because of the resurrection of these reunions every five years, we see each other periodically. Uh, is it every five years? No. It seems like there's events that will go on. Um, uh, every now and then there will be some kind of a celebration or a Hoosiers uh, get-together. Uh, I keep hearing rumors, Bernie, that they're going to do a big thing at the 25-year mark, which will be five years from now. Uh, I've heard rumors of re-releasing the movie in the theaters for a whole new generation who hasn't seen it on the big screen, has just seen it via DVD or, or VCR tape. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard they're going to recreate the premiere that they did 25 years ago downtown. Now, these are rumors that I hear. I can't substantiate any of that, but uh, you hear talk of things upcoming. and um, It's one of those things that will always be a part of my life. I'm grateful for it. I have to be at the right place at the right time. You know, Gene Hackman has said in interviews that, you know, I, he says, I don't do French Connection reunions, you know, as big as some of the movies he's done, Hoosiers is the one that keeps getting resurrected to do these little reunion things and, and uh, get together. So that's kind of neat to be a part of that. I, I did want to ask you, I went back to my notes here, but uh, uncredited uh, little, one of the people that appeared in the movie was Bobby Plump, right. who the character of Morris Valenus was based on that. Where is Bobby Plump in the movie? Yeah, Bobby, actually, he, he was very involved with the movie. He actually showed us uh, through some choreography how he shot the shot, where he shot it on the court. Um, but as it turns out, I don't know that Bobby is actually in the movie. And I think it had to do with shooting schedule. Part of it was it, his schedule and that type of thing. And it may also have had something to do with the fact that he was so involved with showing us stuff that I think they kind of used him in that role rather than they actually put him in the film. On the other side of the coin, Ray Kraft ended up getting the role of uh, welcoming us into Hinkle right, Fieldhouse. Right. And um, uh, Tom Carnegie is in it as a, um, he's uh, a cameo photographer. At that time, Mayor Bill 
Bill Hudnut as a cameo, uh, as a photographer. If you look real closely, you'll see some Indianapolis and Indiana figures in it. Ray Crow, who coached Oscar Robertson, is the opposing coach uh, of the South Bend team that we play in the final game. So every here and there, if you look closely, you'll see little cameo appearances of some Indiana figures. But Bobby, I don't think, was actually in the film. He had more of a uh, role in the, in the production of it, if you will, rather than being in, in the actual film. You know, while the movie was going on and as you know you're in the shooting schedule you guys young and I'm assuming at the time you had said you'd gotten engaged but probably young single have the world ahead of you uh, and I asked Steve the same question how many of you entertained the thought of possibly doing doing more acting well yeah for me you know I was 23 at the time maybe maybe a little older and wiser to some degree I you know had I been 17 or 16 I might have run out to Hollywood and tried my luck and probably come back with my tail between my legs but because I was 23 I had a uh, upcoming marriage I had a job I just signed with maybe realize the odds on doing that and look you know this was a lucky break uh, I was no actor I tell people I played Jacob Marley and Scrooge in the fifth grade that was my acting resume so this was just one of those lucky breaks uh, happened to fit a character they were looking for happened to have played some basketball which the movie was about so I think it was just kind of a once-in-a-lifetime experience and I'm grateful for it you know they talked at one time about doing a sequel uh, I'm so glad they didn't I think they would have ruined the first one you know so many times you do a sequel and it becomes so hokey it sort of takes away from the first one kind of tarnishes it very very rarely does a sequel do well Godfather 2 comes to mind as one of the few exceptions it did as well as the first original Godfather but there's not very many more that you can name that do well the second time around so I'm glad they tabled that and just left it as it is to stand alone if you could sum up and maybe one final thought here one uh, doesn't have to be one line but just uh, the, the legacy or being part of a legacy of what some people consider the, the greatest sports movie ever made uh, ESPN had it as you know number one on a number obviously a lot of great movies on that list but Hoosiers right at the top uh, what, what can you leave our viewers with is maybe just one final thought one final summation of your feelings personally of being being part of this well I mean it's hard to put that in a, in a, in a small statement but I will tell you it was a humbling experience uh, thrilled to have been a part of it and I think uh, if I had to sum up I, I think that this is one of those movies and ESPN keeps resurrecting uh, the fact that you know they rank it very highly but again Bernie I think it's because you've got the combination of of sports which people gravitate towards sports as, as, as a general rule you've got a true story an actual event that actually happened and then you've got a pretty realistic portrayal of how that event happened you throw all that together and you mix it in with some side issues some redemption second chance uh, themes throughout the movie and you've got a pretty good recipe there for a good movie um, uh, you know the biggest thrill I get now when I run into an elderly man who might be in his 70s and it's happened to me and they'll come up to me with a little bit of a tear and say you know that's the way it was that's the way it was in the 50s we had those caravans to the games we had those barbershop scenes we had those deals where the town closed down and went to the, the high school game that makes me feel good it makes me feel like these guys David and Angelo got it right they captured what that era was like what basketball meant to Indiana folks during that era uh, and, and to me, that's the recipe for success. You know, you could have done this movie and it could have been very hokey. It could have been non-realistic. It could have uh, been kind of... Uh, um, uh, Synth synthetic sized. I can't. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a word, but it would have looked very unrealistic had you done it in Hollywood. Instead, they did it actually in Indiana and made it realistic. And um, I just think that is what the legacy will be left. That it was a re realistic portrayal of Indiana basketball in the 1950s. And I guess I'd have to add my two cents. Or I guess I'm kind of glad it wasn't called Best Shot. Right, <laughs> which they toyed with. <laughs> yeah. So, Brad, we uh, boy, we appreciate your time. We've gone. Uh, we usually do a thirty-minute show, and I think we've gone maybe a good forty-five, fifty minutes here. And we certainly appreciate you taking time, letting us come into your home and uh, mm -hmm. do the show today. And I'm sure our viewers, as uh, as we are just about to embark on another high school basketball season, are certainly going to enjoy listening uh, to the stories from. Uh, what I consider the greatest sports movie ever, probably the greatest movie ever, of the right. movie Hoosiers. But Brad, thank you. Well, thank you, you Bernie. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so very thank much. You. So, until we see you the next time, this has been Bernie Probensky along with Brad Long from the movie Hoosiers for the Ben Davis Sports Talk Show here on DeKalb Public Television, Mediacom Cable Channel 20. Have a good day, everybody.